I've been making complex 3D models for like 20 years, but only in the last handful have I been able to hold them in my hand and see all of the tiny details that I created and be like, yeah, I made this. This didn't exist and now it does. <laughs> I love it so much. I talk about 3D printing a lot on this channel. If you're new around here, it's not only one of my favorite tools, but something I have become a bit of an expert in over the years. I often describe it to those unfamiliar as being akin to sci-fi, and even with all of my experience, the technology continues to astound me. I'm always hungry to do more of it. So when Formlabs invited me to Boston for their 10-year anniversary design hackathon, how could I possibly say no to having access to cutting-edge technology, unlimited materials, and my own team to help me bring an idea to life? This is basically alley catnip. I am helpless to resist this. The hackathon didn't have any particular themes or constraints other than a decent budget, which meant I could ultimately do whatever I wanted. Turns out that what I wanted to do meant that I, uh, I knew this guy. If you aren't familiar with DJ, he spends most of his time building incredible functional robots and animatronics of wild fictional characters, giving them life in ways nobody has dared to do before. I wanted his big, smart, motor-minded brain to help make some kind of weird, moving, 3D-printed dream a reality. I've been wanting to make something for ages now, visually inspired by La Sagrada Familia, the insane 100-plus-year melting cathedral project designed by Spanish artist Antony Gaudí. I'm particularly fond of the stained glass inside of the main hall. And I've been wanting to make something like Festo's wildly impressive biomechanical robots. Which means we need to find a subject that can, you know, do both. So after we looked at every animal on the internet, we settled on this cheeky bugger. This is the dogbane leaf beetle, and it's got all the best bug features. Fat little body, tiny head, Pixar style feet, cute disproportionately long antenna. But most importantly, it's shiny <laughs> and small. But our beetle needs to be a lot bigger to fit all the required nonsense inside. You mean we can't make a beetle the old fashioned way? Okay, I like being able to wear my work. So we decided to make this project into an incredibly ostentatious necklace and make the dogbane leaf beetle the centerpiece for it. We both like to suffer. So of course we had to include as many features and components as humanly possible in the space available inside the little buggy boy. But to really make the most of our access to the entire Formlabs material library and to maximize our suffering, we're also going to cast the entire beetle in sterling silver. So now the design requires modeling, digital sculpting, complex 3D printing, programming, soldering, molding, and casting, and we have to get the design right on the first try because neither of us has the resources to cast silver at home, and the hackathon only lasts three days. What could go wrong? It's fine. Nothing ever goes wrong with design. Before we can even start thinking about most of this stuff though, I need to start modeling. I'm going to start the modeling process in Fusion, building up shapes with NURBS so I can create the organic forms I need while managing dimensions and keeping it so that DJ can still edit the model. But I'm also going to import the model into ZBrush so that I can add all that hand sculpted detail. While Ali is in ZBrush land, I'm going to start puzzling out the mechanisms for the beetle. We want it to mechanically do two things, rotate the antennae and also open up the outer shells called elytra to reveal the stained glass matrix of LEDs within the abdomen. This all sounds pretty simple and straightforward, and maybe it is when you don't have a flight to catch to Boston and literally only a few days to do it and the person you're working with is on the other side of the globe while you do it. Hmm. If you're confused as to why we're making a bizarre bit of hardware for something called a hackathon, you'd be forgiven given that hackathons are typically code writing marathons, but not at Formlabs. Every year, Formlabs gives their employees time and a budget to design whatever they like without constraint. This year, instead of keeping it employees only, they invited a few of us maker influencers to mix things up a bit. Since they're a 3D printer company, the emphasis here is around creating physical pieces of work, which kind of brings us to why we're here. Now that we're in Boston, we've got some work to do. The chest piece of the necklace is split into a few main parts based on material. The flexible dog's bane leaves, the rigid inner beetle body, and the outer shells, antenna, and legs, which need to be made in silver. Since we were tight on time, the Formlabs team started printing some parts for us to have ready when we arrived. These things admittedly look weird as hell, but there's a logic behind the weirdness. The clear leaves are actually a flexible resin that need to be supported all over or they will warp horribly in the printing process. The strange purple beetle pieces are actually two different types of wax resin. One better for tiny details and delicate pieces, and one easier to cast with. Like with all resin-based printing, even though the materials are less typical, we still need to wash off uncured resin and then kind of bake them in a UV oven so they reach maximum strength and can be safely handled. They also need to be painstakingly removed from the build platform. 
and all those tiny supports removed. Being able to print crazy detailed parts in wax for casting is awesome, but the work is only just getting started. The rest of the process is entirely done by hand, is not super easy, and has so many ways to mess it up. I'm incredibly grateful to Formlabs casting expert Sean for his assistance in this process because it takes a lot of time and physical labor to do silver investment casting, and as a team, it was a lot more manageable. Before the wax prints can be transformed into their silver counterparts, they need to be carefully attached to a tree-like structure. The tree shape, once hollow, provides a nice channel for the metal to travel through to our beetle pieces. All of this wax gives us the positive for our would-be mold, but the mold itself still needs to be made. For this, we must bring out the forbidden milkshake. We're doing what's called investment casting, named as such because we're using investment plaster to make the molds, an ultra-fine powder that captures all the tiny details of the models perfectly. This gets poured into the flasks containing the model trees and to gas in a vacuum chamber to remove the bubbles. If everything goes right, you get a nice solid mold. And if it doesn't go right, you get a huge mess on the floor and Henry has to mop it up. Sorry, Henry. But once the messes are cleaned up and the plaster is poured, the flasks go in the special burnout kilns where the molds harden up and the wax melts out over the next 12 hours. Meanwhile, we need to finish the mechanical design. Due to the timeline, we couldn't finalize the internal mechanisms beforehand, so the beetle parts only have simple pegs to align them to future pieces. We want the beetle elytra to open up and out using these Wii servos, and there's not a lot of space inside. I spent most of day one laying out parts and researching how actual beetles open up, but that didn't yield much success. I'm only mildly panicked. We also started finalizing more of the abdomen, refining the model so that the many mini stained glass window pieces would fit. These clear resin parts came out beautifully though, and the tiny 2020 RGB LEDs that will go behind each piece fit just fine. While I was working on the mechanical design, teammates Adrian, Quinn, and Richard began testing out the electronics, including the thermal camera and LEDs. So bright. No, not ready. Not ready. Not ready. Yes, my impatience was showing, but we clearly still had an entire beetle to cast, clean up, and assemble, and stress plus excitement are extremely good motivators. The molds were hot and fresh in the kilns, and the time had come to get our metal molten. Sean had expertly calculated ahead of time the exact weight of silver we would need for each flask, and after measuring out a combination of reclaimed and new silver, it was time to dump it all in the vacuum casting crucible. Because uh, there is sometimes a nice little fireball. Fireball. The time had finally come. You have all the power. They are specific for how much mass is in each one. It is a lot heavier when it's not yeah. material hit. Yeah. Good grip. Good grip. Shut, and then you pull that for seven seconds. Okay. All right. Set. Yep. Congratulations. Nice. Fast. Fun. There's a break in between those two. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. Do you want to do one? Uh, no. Once the metal is no longer red hot, it's quenching time. All the way up. Whoa. Whoa. Kind of like a volcano, huh? Scratch. Once it stops bubbling, all that's gone, and you can just spray it over here. The pieces obviously come out unpolished and still a bit covered in plaster schmutz, but right away you can see that the casting was a success. Now to do the whole thing a few more times. Once the playing with fire part is over, there's nothing left but the long and arduous task of cleaning up a pound of silver in the shape of a beetle. The cleanup process for sterling silver is relatively straightforward, if not exceptionally tedious, as is the way with all post-processing. There's a ton of overly aggressive grinding to remove all of the excess silver, rough grit sanding drums to fix any imperfections in the casts, moving through a range of finer and finer abrasives to remove scratches, until finally being able to hit everything with polishing compound and felt discs until it has a 
mirror shine. This might not look like much, but it has to be done over and over again for each individual part. There are no shortcuts. It took about half of day two to complete the process for all of these cast pieces. I literally sanded silver until my face bled. I think it was worth it. For most of the weekend, I spent my time coming up with an alternate mechanism to make the beetle move. I scrapped my initial incomplete design and moved over to a simpler mechanism that was a four bar linkage that would open up the shell more wide and to the side. The linkages are both actuated by this central sliding carriage that would be moved by a single servo, in theory. I still had to make sure that all the components would fit nicely. That means mounting the thermal camera and microcontroller in a way that doesn't block anything and is easy to assemble. Obviously, these things all need to be printed and tested to see if they even work, and things weren't all working out. Allie had also modeled some flowers, and while the prints came out nicely, the casts, maybe not so much. But things were coming together, and we were close to the finish line, which meant doing some of the final artistic touches for the project. We have leaves. We have leaves. So we actually ended up printing like two different versions. This is actually a 50A, so it's super floppy, whereas this is an 80. It's definitely still flexible. It's nowhere near as soft as this one, but actually the softness is not necessarily ideal here. Like we want some flexibility, but not too much. So actually I'm not going to use the 50. I'm going to use the 80, but this is just clear and not very interesting right now. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take these alcohol inks. I'm basically going to dye it. I'm going to kind of tint it green and then finish it up with a chrome kind of ink, chrome pen over the veins. I, I'm only hoping this is going to look good. So let's just do it and see what happens. By the end of the weekend, we were utterly exhausted and our project table was a bit of a showcase of all the work done to accomplish our goals. But we absolutely got everything done and the project was a complete success in every way, right? Not even a little bit. Oh. The hackathon was amazing and it was honestly a lot of fun having a whole weekend to dedicate to a project alongside interesting and talented people that we usually don't get to work with. But it's pretty unrealistic for a whole project of this level of complexity to be able to be pulled off in a little over a week, let alone three days. While there are times that is necessary to run yourself into the ground for a project, this wasn't one of those times. So back to work then? Yeah, back to work. The chaos of the event made it so much challenging to keep track of everything that had been done and everything that still needed doing. Now that we're away from that chaos, it's a lot easier to take a look at everything and lay out what needs doing to turn all of these parts into a finished piece. The silver beetle pieces and the leaves for the most part are complete. The abdomen pieces have been printed, but still require a bit of post-processing and paint. There are new pieces for the mount and mechanism that opens up the beetle and moves the antenna that also need cleaning up. Allie ended up revisiting the moving elements of the design, to make things a bit more streamlined, and somehow managed to cram three of these tiny servo motors inside the space within the beetle. I had a bit of a vision as to how the electric should open and the linkage system just didn't accomplish that in a way I liked. Now the motion is simplified by using spur gears at a precise angle to lift the elytra up and out in one movement. I also designed an elegant compact set of bevel gears to move the antenna in opposing directions from a single servo perched at a jaunty angle within the thorax. These tiny pieces were all printed on my Form 4 back in California, but still need cleaning up and testing. Of course, we still need to wire everything up and solder umpteen itty bitty 2020 LEDs inside the abdomen. You're doing that part. I know I'm doing that part. <laughs> yeah, there uh, might still be a fair bit to do. suffering going. Uh, I have regrets. I have many regrets. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, there 
there was a fair bit still to do. It easily took more time to complete the build than it took to prepare for it and do the entire hackathon weekend, even with two of us working full days to accomplish it. But that doesn't mean it wasn't worth it. If anything, this project served well to highlight how this incredible technology makes things possible that would have previously been impossible, or at least take a far longer time to do. The impossible is definitely possible, and it looks absolutely incredible. wrong. I think this ridiculous, surprisingly weighty necklace came out pretty great. But the truth is, a lot of this was an intense learning experience and was not guaranteed to work in the first place. I mean, I guess that's usually the case with these things, but humor me a bit here. It turns out that combining an unpredictable hand-finished element with tiny mechanical parts that need sub-millimeter accuracy and also need to fit perfectly with the aforementioned hand-finished pieces is really insanely difficult. The fact that this is something that needs to be able to run repeatedly and reliably made everything even more challenging. Every time we thought we were about finished, something would start to have problems that often required lengthy, frustrating troubleshooting to figure out the underlying issue. There were several tiny inconsistencies that in another project, a little less small and mechanically complex, wouldn't really be a problem. But remember that sub-millimeter accuracy I mentioned before? Yeah, I wasn't joking about that. Over and over again, I had to manually compensate for those inaccuracies by carefully grinding away bits of material until things worked as intended. Thankfully for everyone invested in the final result, I am incredibly stubborn, and as a result, it now appears to work without issue. The whole thing looks great on its own, but it really shines when it's in action. The thermal camera hidden in the thorax is what brings the whole thing to life, triggering different reactions based on how close someone is to it. Now that my personal beetle proximity alarm is ready for use, I'm going to be wearing it to all sorts of events and seeing how it gets on in the real world. If you had a fashionable bit of kit that could allure and repel onlookers, where would you want to wear it? I know y'all have some weird ideas, so you better share them with me. Obviously, this ridiculous project wouldn't have been possible without my talented collaborator DJ or Formlabs for giving us the opportunity to use their headquarters as our personal casting station. Stay tuned for more absurdist functional art and 3D printing, of course, but in the meantime, do bugger off. You are ridiculous. Oi. What? Oi. <laughs> What up? What up?